welcome to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters, and I am speaking this week with regular contributor and representative Emily Kornheiser, one of three representatives for the town of Brattleboro, because we had some happenings this week in Montpelier. Uh, the legislature uh, all convened for a special session and Emily was there. I'm just gonna quickly, Emily, give a broad uh, kind of grounding for folks. And then I would love to dive in and, and get the details from you. So great. for folks who, folks who didn't know, um, on Monday, the Senate and the House met to vote on um, legislation allowing municipalities to pass was it not a legislation? Was it a resolution? No, my phone rang. And so I was oh. making a motion to apologize for that, but it's done ringing now and you should continue on with your glorious sentences. Sorry about that. Why, thank you, darling. Um, so to pass legislation allowing municipalities to pass local ordinances around wearing masks during COVID. And what's interesting for me, the, the legislation did pass. Scott, who has kind of really not been on board with having local mask mandates or mandates in general for masks, uh, did sign the legislation, um, but it does have a number of provisions, sunset provisions basically uh, built in that I'm sure Emily will share with us. What I find interesting for me is at least I feel on many ways that this was um, a, a move that was triggered again, from that conversation we've had many times about Dil being a Dillon's real estate and that towns, specifically Mont uh, Brattleboro and I believe East Montpelier had passed resolutions asking people to wear masks inside in public places. And the state had said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, and this is kind of what I, as I see it, and Emily, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, this is sort of the knock-on effect of that uh, discussion. And I know it's a little more deep than that. I, I think um, it's actually, it's just, it's much more sausage making than that. This entire okay. conversation is gonna be about sausage making and very little about masks. And that is maybe why people tune into the happy hour. I don't know, so we'll see. Well, no, I think, I think they do. That's why we have these conversations at least. Uh, I'll just say one more thing before we go on uh, for folks who are local listeners in the Brattleboro area, anticipating that this legislation was going to be passed the board did meet, I believe last night, Tuesday night, because we're pre-recording this on Wednesday, and did pass and kind of uh, finalize their mask um, mandate. Uh, their res what is it? They're calling it a resolution to wear cloth face coverings in all indoor spaces in Brattleboro. So just heads up for everyone in the Brattleboro area. So Emily, yeah, we have the whole umbrella around mask mandates and and all the COVID stuff. But what do you think is kind of the the big nugget here that maybe for you isn't being talked about, but is actually at the core of all this? Um, so I think it's being what I'm we're I'm going to talk about is very much being talked about in the legislature and among legislators, but it might be coming out less in public because I think most of us realize that constituents are very busy and have other things to think about. And what they wanna hear about is like what we're actually getting done and not what we can't get done. But people tune into the Montpelier Happy Hour for other reasons. And so I'm here to talk about what we can't get done. Um, <laughs> so, Not for lack of trying though. <laughs> what? Not for lack of trying. Not for lack of trying. So here's, I'm gonna take us sort of a little bit into the way back machine. So as I assume everyone remembers, about a few weeks after COVID really first hit Vermont, we, um, the governor passed an emergency order, um, which gives him, once that's passed, and he has sole discretion to create that, the legislature doesn't mm -hmm. have to pass something for him to do that. Um, for the governor, regardless of their gender, to do that. Um, and when that happens, 
they have broad powers. And under those broad powers, we um, closed down a lot of businesses. We limited the number of people who could be in inside dining establishments. We set up certain rules. We, um, he created rules around face coverings anywhere in public. There were all kinds of other things. There was weird things about hiking that made no sense. Anyway, really like some broad, serious work to slow the spread of COVID. And it worked. We slowed the spread of COVID better than any other state in the country. And then the vaccines came and many of us got them and we did a better job with vaccines than anywhere else in the country. And there are a lot of reasons that we did a better job with vaccines than anywhere else in the country. And there are a lot of reasons that we did a better job with slowing the spread and shutting down than anywhere else in the country. And a lot of that is about the particular demographics of Vermont and the way we're structured and not so much about the magic of Phil Scott, but he did a great, and we've talked about that before, mm -hmm. but he like followed the science there. Yeah, so he managed then, the situation well. I think yeah. a lot of people would agree. Yes. And so then, as I'm sure again, everyone remembers, the Delta variant came at the beginning of the summer. And we had already opened the spigot in the governor's terms and had really like completely reopened the state because we were doing so well and the vaccines were here. And what we saw very quickly was really pretty substantial increased community spread. And we have had Ann Sosin, um, who's a public health expert at Dartmouth on the show twice to talk about sort of what you do in that situation and what public health experts recommend in that situation. And she talked through it. And if people want to go back and listen to those podcasts, please do. She also was on The Dig, which is Vermont Digger's podcast this last week. And there's a bunch of articles and op-eds that she's published in Digger, which are great to read. Um, the op-eds are fantastic. So, and she, she usually does them, writes them with a team as well, which yes. I just love all the different perspectives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I really recommend people read the offense more than listen to our podcast, even though our podcast is super duper awesome. <laughs> so all of that happened. Um, and then what the primary thing that most public health experts recommend, um, the CD, including the CDC, is that if community spread is at a certain level, if case counts are at a certain level, then people should wear face coverings in public spaces. That is the CDC's blanket recommendation to the entire country. And that is what public health experts, other public health experts other than the CDC recommend. What becomes complicated is that it's not entirely clear to people when the face covering should be turned on and off because most people don't track the case counts daily mm -hmm. and the numbers can get really overwhelming really really fast but what we know is that more than 90 percent of counties in the u.s are past the case count on a daily basis that is sort of the cdc's cutoff for face coverings in public nevada passed this really cool law because they were in session during all of this, I think. You know, actually possible, it was something their governor did. I, I actually don't know the political mechanics of that. But Nevada has this cool rule that turns their mask, their facial covering rules on and off based on case counts. And so as a case count goes up, the facial covering rules go on, case counts go down, the facial covering rules go off. And that is not driven by like individuals tracking the case counts. It's that like public health experts and um, folks who administer laws are the ones who track it and then the signs go up or the signs go down and then everyone you know can see the signs and no because I think some people have been wearing masks all this time and some people have been mostly not wearing masks but the vast majority of people really look to other people's cues on whether or not mm -hmm. to wear a mask in a certain space and part of that is like, no one wants to be the weirdo wearing a mask when no one else is wearing a mask. And no one wants to be the weirdo not wearing a mask when everyone else is wearing a mask because we are creatures of social norms in New England, particularly we are creatures of social norms. <laughs> um, and none of us have the bandwidth to make all of these evidence-driven decisions every single day on our own. Yeah. And so rules like this, I think more than control us actually serve 
as cues to us about what the healthy move is, given that it's really, really hard for us to track all of the mm-hmm. cues all the time. And so for me, rather than having to check the paper every morning to see what the case counts are, if I knew that there was a mandate like that in place and it turned on, I would also know that I might want to shift some of my other behaviors, like things I do in private with friends. I might want to sort of, you know, pot up with a smaller group of friends if case counts got that high or test myself more regularly, things like that. So, okay, that's, that's what sort of generally broadly is considered bus public health. The legislature has been in recess since May. We went back via Zoom for one session in the middle of the summer to do Mm -hmm. some veto overrides. I honestly don't even remember what they were, which is super embarrassing. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And then- We'll be embarrassed together, it's okay. (laughs) Great. And at that point when we did that, we recessed to um, a date certain, which is how we have to do it. And that date was set actually for really early October. And it was specifically for if we had, um, if the infrastructure bill had passed for us to begin a conversation oh, about right. how to spend that. Right, right. Um, that date passed. And in sort of that time, folks all over the state have been calling on the governor and the administration to do more about the really like intense spread of COVID that we're seeing. Because even though we have face coverings in schools, most of the spread happens at the community level. And so teachers and students are getting COVID and schools are shutting down and parents can't work and everything is just really, and then people are dying. People are dying in Vermont from COVID. Um, Strains on the healthcare system, all the things, I don't really think we need to get into it. But the sausage making is that people have been begging, pleading, yelling, Mm-hmm. Etc. with the governor and the administration to do something. Well, and just to interrupt you for a second, I think especially around face masks, um, and, and I don't think I'm a, alone in noticing this, that quite often when it comes to businesses wanting to have face masks, it's, you know, the, the checkout clerk yes. who has to tell people to do this or not. And it puts a lot of pressure on individuals to kind of enforce this thing without having either a municipality or a state or some kind of governing body backing them up basically. Absolutely. And that's just really hard. Let's, let's hold that thought about the idea of towns holding this sort of as the intermediary, because that's really powerful. So there's been begging and begging and pleading and begging and yelling. And during that time, we've actually seen a reduction in force in contact tracing. We've seen less testing availability on the local level, Mm -hmm. though we have seen vaccine availability. But I will tell you, as someone who spends a lot of time even during the off session in Montpelier for off session meetings, it is so much easier to get a vaccine in Washington and Chittenden County than it is down here. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Huh, is, do you have any, reason for that? Do you happen to know why that might be? No, I think there's just more people and there's more people who are focused on those things, focused on those things up there, but more, it's more infrastructure really perhaps. Um, so what we've seen is sort of, and I bring that up less to say like Southern Vermont's forgotten because I don't really like to buy into that trope very much, but more to right. say there's really been a constriction in where the focus of where the focus has been. And what we're seeing is that outlying counties, the kingdom, all the counties in the kingdom, Rutland County have seen these like really intense case spikes. So begging, pleading, case spikes, constriction and focus. Um, Everyone feels stuck. And sort of in the midst of that, Brattleboro and a few other towns, but sort of Brattleboro first, passed a local mask ordinance, um, especially given that tourism had gone up. And I think there was a lot of concern, as you said, Olga, from local business owners who were putting mask rules in place in their businesses and felt like they were getting a lot of pushback and they wanted someone else to point to and say, you know, this is a community decision. This isn't just my individual decision that I need to defend. Um, because we had like a lot of day trippers who didn't know community norms, all kinds of things. 
And so in the midst of all that, Brattleboro passed this ordinance. Brattleboro passed this ordinance under a set of statute that provides for municipalities to be allowed to make public health decisions. So the select board essentially like, to, you know, if I don't know how many people listen to the show watch the select board meetings, but sometimes they um, will sort of take off their select board hats and put on like liquor commissioner hats or they'll take off their select board hats and, you know, reconvene as the board of civil authority by adding a few more people or they'll, t- anyway, one of them put yeah. on is like this health authority hat. Mm-hmm. And they did that in the context of a set of statute, which does not name face coverings explicitly, but says that municipalities can make decisions to protect the public health. And so they passed this ordinance and sent it up to the um, Dr. Levine, who's the health commissioner. And everyone just sort of assumed like they were just basically filing paperwork from the town's perspective. They were not asking permission. And it turned out that um, they were denied the right to do this. And, and yeah, Emily, I don't know if you know this, but it's never been clear to me like where in the chain of command, for lack of a better term, the denial came from. Did it come from the Vermont Department of Health? Did it come from the administration? It came from the administration. It came explicitly okay. from the governor's office via Dr. Levine. Um, okay, that was Thank very you. much, and it was made clear to the select board that that's what was happening. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, And town folks were really surprised. Um, Our town attorney was super surprised. He's been doing this for a long time. Our town manager was super surprised. He's, you know, has been chair of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. He's been also doing this for a long time. Um, And so that was really strange. Um, And the, the league pushed a little bit. So the Vermont League of Cities and Towns is sort of the convening body of town governments and town managers, and they sort of speak for local authority and mm-hmm. local control. Um, and everyone was really surprised and there was like a little bit of pushback, but then it sort of, you know, everyone was just like, this is not gonna move anywhere, who cares? What you gonna do? Yeah. And so in the mix of all of that um, was again, this like real pushing from legislative leaders. We have to do something, we have to do something, we have to do something. The league did not continue pushing this. I just want to be sort of clear about that. This was not one of the league's major major focuses. Because again, everyone agrees that it's actually best public health policy to do something statewide rather than a patchwork of local decisions. Even though local decision-making is very strong and powerful in Vermont, everyone sort of, all the public health experts agreed that it's best to do something statewide. So that all sort of- on a sorry but on a practical level too then everyone's going by the same rule nobody has to be like okay so i'm in brattleboro so i have to wear my mask but when i go to dover or wardsboro i don't but wilmington like you don't have to ask those questions like everybody knows yes everybody knows and similar to how you were saying like you know shopkeepers want to take the pressure off of themselves Municipal leaders also don't want to be responsible for this issue, which has become incredibly politicized, incredibly politicized. And so having those fights at the local level gets like really can get pretty dirty and unpleasant. Um, And so local leaders also didn't want to have responsibility for that kind of um, like really national level gnashing of teeth politics. They prefer to focus on things that are much less partisan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so under sort of this increased pressure, my understanding is that the governor's press conferences were getting more and more, um, the press was pushing more and more on the governor on these issues. The governor was getting testier and testier and more and more defensive, which is not something that's his sort of usual go-to move. I think people were really surprised to hear that tone coming from his voice. And under that increased pressure, he came forward with something that his administration described as an olive branch, which is that he would be willing in his benevolence to reconvene the legislature because we are not allowed to reconvene ourselves until January. The governor can call us back, but we cannot call ourselves back. So another example of when that happened and the legislature was sort of trapped in that scenario is when um, 
states all across the country were passing white women's suffrage mm-hmm. amendments. Mm-hmm. Vermont was out of session at that time, and the governor refused to call the legislature back to vote on white women's suffrage. That's right. And just in case anyone's ever in the state house, a portrait of that governor who failed to call the legislature back to vote on white women's suffrage is in room 10 on the wall if anyone wants to check it out. And I won't tell anyone if you throw darts. So, <laughs> or, or give them the finger, you can do that. Yeah, too. whatever you want to do. But he's there staring at you all day long in room 10. So, <laughs> the governor agreed in his benevolence to allow us to do our, our work and come back together. But he was very clear that. The only thing that he would not veto was the authority for towns to pass their own facial covering rules. Mm -hmm. And that those facial covering rules can only last for 30 days, at which point they need to be renewed. So towns need to have this internal debate every 30 days. That's exhausting. And remember, towns already have this authority under the law. Huh. So the legislature. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that's just a disconnect my brain's not not making right now. So if the towns already had that authority, and I think most of us agree they do, because like, you know, there's the health inspector who does will inspect like uh rental buildings and all these things that towns are already doing. So I guess I don't understand how the governor could tell them no if they had that authority. Like, my is am I the only one who's not getting this? Um, no, no. And so that's the trap. So okay. the town's previous authority is implicit authority, and this is explicit authority. Uh, and so okay. Okay. I guess like someone could shake it out on that. Um, so where do I start? So yeah, sorry about that, honey. the governor handed us a trap. It is, while the towns hypothetically are already allowed to do this, the administration is constraining them from doing it, so they're not doing it. Having some towns be able to pass facial covering rules is better than having no one able to pass facial covering rules. But it means that we are, one, allowing the governor to dictate our legislative decisions, which is a real breach of sort of a separation of powers authority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we want to stand up for the rights of towns because that's another real um, balance of powers issue. Mm -hmm. But by passing this, we are acknowledging that the towns didn't have this authority already, which they did. Another balance of powers challenge. And Again, we all agree it's really not the right thing to do. It's not the best public health authority move. Right. And so, plus, convening in the middle of a public health crisis when the building has actually not yet been prepared for us is also Mm -hmm. incredibly difficult. So none of us want to be all showing up in Montpelier, in person, in close quarters with each other, in the middle of a pandemic. In addition to the fact that it is Monday, we are asked to convene on Monday of Thanksgiving week. So if I do my math and my understanding of public health guidelines and COVID guidelines, I will be at my, if I did in fact get COVID yesterday from being in close quarters with my colleagues from all over the state, I will be at my most infectious on Wednesday and Thursday when I am seeing my father my, sorry, dad, my elderly father, who is at quite an increased risk of dying of COVID, though he is vaccinated. So I don't know if everyone remembers further in the way back machine when the governor said that we wanted to cancel Christmas when we talked about increased COVID guidelines, which by the way, in case anyone's wondering, is not a thing you should say about a Jewish legislator whom Senator Ballant is. You do not talk about Jews canceling Christmas if you are not trying to start like an anti-Semitic culture war. But I will say the governor ruined Thanksgiving. So 
That's the whole story. (laughs) That's the whole story leading up to the gloriousness that was Monday. And um, I can launch into what actually happened on Monday if you want to. That would be great. We're we're just at coming to the end of this um, this session or this um, portion before we have to go to break. I'm, I'm stuttering because my brain is is firing in like 14 different directions. It's all pretty amazing. <laughs> it really is pretty amazing. And I guess what I'm I'm struggling with right now, just at, on an individual level, is. I realize we're all, we've all got COVID fatigue. Like we are sick and tired of this stupid pandemic at this point, but it's not done. No. Which means we really still need to be responding to it. And I just feel, I guess what I'm struggling with is, and I was sitting with this list when I was listening this morning to the news coverage of Monday, just like, we came so far, we worked so hard at the beginning of the pandemic to flatten the curve and slow the spread. And our work isn't done, but it feels sometimes like a lot of the, I'm gonna say the administration, but I may be wrong. Um, It just feels to me like the administration has kind of been like, okay, we're done. We're moving on. We've reopened. This is back to normal or something. I don't, I I don't want to, I'm, I don't want to put words into the governor's mouth because I don't know what he's thinking, but that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. And I'm just really struggling with that. And I'm a little frustrated with it. One piece that he keeps on bringing up as sort of a defense of not doing anything is that the only option, um, to do something is to go back to like the full shutdown we had before. And no one I know is asking for that. Like Mm -hmm. none of the legislative pleas, none of the letters to the editor, none of those are asking for the level of shutdown that we experienced before, but he's either actually stuck in this super dualistic thinking of everything or nothing, or he's using it as a political talking point to just scare people. Hmm. Um, but either way, it's not a very helpful frame to be having this conversation. Well, especially because what also I've been speaking with some health professionals and they're talking about going from making that transition from pandemic planning to endemic planning. Yes. And that's, that's a big deal for folks who don't know. That means going from, oh my gosh, here's this point in time that we have to respond to, to this virus is now a part of our lives and how do we respond to it ongoing for the rest of our lives kind of thing, mm-hmm. uh, putting it in very simple terms. And that's, that's a big deal yeah. to, to make that transition. Yeah. Um, we have to hear from some underwriters. So stay tuned, Emily, and I will be back in a moment. Thank you. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro your community radio station. If you are just joining us, I am your host, Olga Peters, and I am speaking with regular contributor and representative Emily Kornheiser about mask mandates and a special session that was held on Monday. Um, For anyone who wants to check out past episodes of the show, you can find us on BCTV, as well as Emily's YouTube channel and our Captivate page, as well as wherever you find podcasts. So Emily, what are some of, you mentioned in the break that there are some procedural um, things like sausage making that you think is really pertinent for people to know. Dive into that for us. Yeah, before I dive into that, I just want to remind folks that the views and opinions expressed around the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests and not any radio station or platform that is broadcasting said views and opinions. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So legislation has a timeline attached to it um, that is designed to ensure that everyone has adequate time to review it, essentially. So under normal circumstances, a piece of legislation is drafted, has sponsors, and then it is um, introduced into the House. And that is called first reading. 
Mm-hmm. And on first reading, it has then just read aloud the name of the bill and then it is sent to a committee. When it is sent to committee, spends time in that committee, the committee discusses it. A vote generally needs to be warned that the committee is going to vote the bill out. The general expectation is 24 hours. Then once the bill is voted out, it sits on the calendar, the House calendar, which people can find on the legislative website for again, 24 hours before it is brought up for second reading. It then a second reading, which is the time where we debate the bill in a full house and then vote on it. And then generally there are 24 hours again before we can have third reading when we vote and debate. Then there's 24 hours after we pass it on third reading before it can be pulled up in the Senate. The, it's messaged and that messaging generally takes 24 hours. And then the Senate has the exact same whirlwind of rules. And then it's 24 hours to get to the governor. And, then and it's the governor, designed to be slow. It's designed to be slow because no one legislating the entire system is not set up for emergency action. It is set up so to be calm and deliberative. And that has protected us from a lot. I think that protected us a lot from um, Donald Trump. But Mm -hmm. it is not designed for this. And so in order to move anything faster, which sometimes we do when just something is just like a not very divisive bill and we just sort of like want to get it over with, sometimes we'll do second and third reading at the same time. Um, Transportation bills tend to be like that. Um, Or at the end of the session, when we're trying to move through the calendar, often we'll suspend rules to message something over to the Senate faster because... We're just running out of time in the week, things like that. Um, but usually that's how it works. In order to have it not work that way, we have to vote to suspend the rules. And that's the official, that's sort of how we do it. And so the Speaker of the House says, um, can I have a motion? And she asks the minority leader, can you make a motion to suspend the rules to take this up on third reading, place this in all stages of passage? move this, you know, messages to the Senate. And the minority leader makes that recommendation because we need more than a simple majority in order to suspend the rules. That all is probably like, it's not something that we think about very often, but during a special session, that means we can only get all the things done in a day if we suspend all of the rules Mm -hmm. and we need the minority party in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that kind of goes back to balance of power and yeah. Yeah. So what that means is that if we were to accept an amendment say to this bill, we would need the minority party to agree to that. If we change something between the Senate version and the House version and we need to send it back to the Senate, we would need rule suspension to do that. Um, It also means the way we structured Monday was that the Senate would deliberate and decide first and then message it to the House. The Senate has a much easier time suspending rules because they have like a super, super majority over there. Um, But they would deliberate and do their work, pass it over to us and we would do our work and then send it on to the governor, which we can do if we don't change the bill between the Senate and the House. If we do change the bill between the Senate and the House, it needs to go back to the body where it originated to be approved again. On Monday, the Senate did their work and then they went home. Oh, interesting. Which is what happens at the end of the session. They zoomed I mean, they, in too. Some right? of them were zoomed in and some of them were in there in real life. But I mean, like metaphorically, they went home. They, okay. reset, they finished their gotcha. work and they closed up book and they were done. And so if we had made any amendments to the bill, we would need A, all those rules suspensions and B, we would need the Senate to come back. They can't come back unless the governor calls them back because they had recessed. 
And so even though once we got there, we might see, oh, this would be better this way, or oh, this would be better that way, or oh, wow, maybe we should follow public health guidelines. We could not do that because of this need to both have agreement between the Senate and the House on versions, and two, be able to suspend rules. And so we needed the administration, the Republican Party's agreement in order to suspend rules to move this forward. If we wanted to go all kinds of wild and do something else, we would have been there for more than five days, which is hard for a number of reasons, including the fact that it costs about $50,000 a day that we're there. And we had rapid tests that were provided to us when we arrived that we were taking every day. If we had slept over, we would have all needed somewhere to sleep that it's all kinds of things. And it's just mm-hmm. the fact that it was Thanksgiving week and there was a lot of struggle to get a quorum because some people had already left town for the holiday before we were even called back. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So we were totally captive to this thing. And I think, you know, um, all politics aside, the governor was quite clever in the little trap that he laid for us. Mm -hmm. And I just want to clarify, um, you you mentioned you'd need the the Republicans to kind of sign on for suspending of the rules. Um, This, some of the conversations around this mask mandate, do you feel they broke down along party lines or was it more nuanced than that? Um, So a lot of the more moderate Republicans spoke out in favor of giving this power to the towns Mm -hmm. at first. And then there was an amendment introduced that I'll talk about. And then they all voted against it saying that they would have voted for it if not for this amendment not passing, which for our Republican party in Vermont is a very, very, very classic tactical move. Hmm. They do this Mm -hmm. all the time. And so that they can, it's a really effective way for them to separate themselves from sort of the national political rhetoric while still sticking to party lines on the actual vote. Hmm, And so um, that happened a lot with the abortion legislation. Um, You know, an amendment was introduced that sort of moderated the abortion bill, um, limited abortions, Mm -hmm. limited with, you know, people's right to an abortion. And then they all said, I would have voted for this if not for this thing that got pointed out during the debate about the amendment. Mm And so um, and, hard to tell if that amendment had never existed, how many people would have voted for it. There is one Republican I'm aware of who voted for it. And um, in a conversation with him, he said, I asked my select board what they wanted and they said they wanted it. And so I voted for it. There you go. Yeah. And, and what about the, the Dems and the, the Progs? Did they? The Dems and the Progs um, almost unanimously voted for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. So... And I think that was hard for a lot of people. I think a lot of people really felt a very strong need to bite their tongue and say like, this is dumb policy, because it is, Mm -hmm. but it's better than no policy. Mm -hmm. Um, The couple Dems who voted against it, one of them um, said basically like, they don't think that the orange is worth the squeeze. Like they don't think that the challenges and the divisiveness that this will bring to small towns is worth whatever respite small towns will get. And a lot of towns in Vermont have no public spaces at all. Mm. Or they have like one store that already has a mask covering roll post in the window, right? Right. So there's also that. So like it becomes, it develops a little bit of an urban rural divide thing. I think most of the mm. communities spread in rural areas are happening in people's homes. Mm-hmm. Um, or workplaces that aren't public spaces. Right. So that's sort of how the vote went. The amendment um, was really interesting. The amendment that was introduced on the House floor pointed out that the place in statute where this piece of policy sits um, is a place that sort of enumerates 
areas where towns have the authority to impose rules. Hmm. And in all of these cases, the whole sort of like bucket of statute that surrounds it, the town can choose civil or criminal penalties. And so this includes um, authority around like towing and snow stuff with roads. Yeah. It includes menageries. Um, <laughs> it's just like a, it's a fairly antiquated and bucket bucket list kind of area of law. And so the bill that the governor handed to the legislature put it there in that bucket. That's how it was mm. constructed. And again, our hands were tied on whether or not we can do, we can create a better law here. This was the law that we sort of had in front of us to vote on unless we wanted to take three weeks, which we didn't have. Um, and so it was pointed out that towns could put criminal penalties if they so chose on facial covering rules. Now, Brattleboro, which is, was one of the first towns to pass a facial covering rule back in the old days. And again, is sort of the example of a town that tried to do this post state of emergency, um, has been very, very clear that they're not even interested in civil penalties for this. It's really just a way of, as I sort of said at the top of the hour, communicating community guidelines to people. Mm -hmm. And that they see that there's no effectiveness and sort of stronger penalties. And I really trust our community to, who's done a huge amount of work on policing and um, the sort of impact of the carceral state and arrests on the quality of life for, you know, for folks who live there. And I really trust our community to stick to those civil penalties, even though they believe very strongly in sort of the mask rules. Mm -hmm. And so there was this scare that was broiled up um, through debate about this, like, you know, the specter of towns going rogue and imposing like year long jail sentences on people for not wearing their facial coverings, um, which was because really, it was, towns in Vermont do that all the time. Yes. <laughs> um, and it was a really effective way of shifting the conversation because like I don't want a single other area of law have criminal penalties attached to it like that's a really mm -hmm. core to my service and my work um and one of my colleagues who's the progressive minority leader and I have huge respect for is basically like devoted her entire legislative service to reducing criminal penalties where they're inappropriate she's on the judiciary committee like this is really important to a lot of people and there are criminal penalties attached to menageries, even though I don't even know what a menagerie is, though I have many questions about it. And I, am, I do intend to figure it out before January. Um, <laughs> and so that was like, it was sort of the perfect subtle poison pill to totally shift the conversation around this from like local control and what's best for Vermonters and public health to this, um, conversation around the specter of criminal penalties. And so that was um, the one amendment that was introduced. We voted it down. It was a, to remove the criminal penalties. It was introduced by um, Representative Donovan, who is a rep from Northfield, a Republican rep, it's really like brilliant woman. And um, not just because of this, she's, if anyone yeah. ever has an opportunity to listen to her during a debate, I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was voted down, not because everyone thinks that there should be criminal t penalties attached to mask rules, but if we had approved the amendment, nothing would have happened. The entire bill would have been dead in the water. Yeah. And so it was a risk that we were taking. And a lot of people are really committed to in January, actually going back and cleaning up that entire area of law. Mm. Um, to remove criminal penalties from all of it because there shouldn't be criminal penalties attached to towing either, right? Right, right. Um, yeah. And so that was nice because it sort of raised the flag on like this. There's a lot of statute and some of it gets like forgotten for about 30 years until someone like goes in and tidies it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, that's a piece of this conversation. Thank and you. so 
we basically all said, and you know, I don't know how many listeners know that I live on good enough road, but I do. And we all said like, this is good enough for now. And when we come back in January, we will have the time and authority to pass much more sensible legislation connected to this. Right. Wow. So one question I have is, and it, it, it may not pertain just to this, what, what happened in the special session. But one thing I'm always curious about is making sure people have the tools they need to uh, carry through policy well. Mm-hmm. And so in my mind, if the state has essentially taken what most towns thought was in their purview, i.e. I. public health, mm-hmm. And said, nope, nope, as a state, we need to make this decision whether or not you can have these mask mandates. Mm-hmm. Then in my mind, it, it means that the state must now also make sure that it gives the, the towns the tools mm-hmm. and the resources to carry this out. If you're taking the, po- the power out of their hands, then in some form, then you need to make sure they have t- tools and resources. Mm-hmm. Do you feel at this point that towns do have the tools and resources they need or? No, no, not at all. And this is sort of an ongoing theme in um, a federation, which is what the United States is, right? So Mm -hmm. we have, um, we regularly since the seventies have devolved power to the states and the states have devolved power to the towns, responsibility really without Mm -hmm. moving money or authority along with it. Right. And so responsibility gets devolved, but authority and revenue does not get devolved. And so there's this huge disconnect between where the responsibility sits and where the money and the power sits, which is a recipe for, well, that fine, we find ourselves in the effects of right now. So um, towns do not have testing capacity. Towns do not have vaccination capacity. Towns do not really have public education capacity. All of that barely even sits at the county level. It very much still sits completely at the state level. Our local departments of health have never been set up. They've always been set up to be instituting very specific programs at the community level and have had very little health authority um, at the county or community level. And so, no, I don't think they have any resources to do really anything right now at all, though I do think it might be interesting to see how much more nimble vaccination clinics and testing clinics might be if they were decided on by folks in the community who sort of knew where people gather Mm -hmm. and what traffic patterns look like and things like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, And I realize that this bill in many ways is evolving. You mentioned going back in January and tidying things up. Anything people should kind of keep in mind or or pay attention to or anything like that? Well, I think if we were going to retain this authority for towns, the fact that it's um, it has to be renewed every 30 days is a recipe for just so much trouble. Um, and so that I think it would you know, I think it would make more sense for it to have that each time a policy is put in place, there needs to be a stop date set to it. But I think communities can determine their own stop dates and come back and renew it. And previously, again, Brattleboro did a really effective job of turning the mandate on and off and checking in regularly to sort of renew that conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, And I use Brattleboro's example because that's where I live and where I serve and the select board's process that I'm the most familiar with. Um, but I think that's true for a lot of towns. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's, you know, I think when we go back, we're going to talk about what increased resources look like for contact tracing to support schools who are going through um, their own testing stuff, increased um, authority responsibility dollars connected to sort of all the other pieces of this public health puzzle. And then we'll see where we are in January requiring regarding the need for mask, um, for facial covering rules and whether that needs is better set sits at the state level or whether just having this at the town level made a difference. Okay. Uh, Emily, thank you so much. 
I look forward to seeing how this conversation evolves. I'm curious if the, we have ended up setting some precedents that may come back in the future. To bite um, us? Yeah. Yeah, I think or, so. Or help us. You never yeah. know. We don't you never know. know. We don't know. Um, so I'm very curious about that. Uh, but in the meantime, this is the week of Thanksgiving. And I, I'm wondering, is there anything you are grateful for right now? Yeah, you know what I'm really grateful for right now, Olga? I'm really grateful for non-dual perspectives. So I'm really grateful that in the lead up to Thursday and Thanksgiving, I can simultaneously feel such gratitude that I have a day of gratitude available to me and for loved ones I'm going to gather with and for the incredible food that my local farmers produced and for my incredible hands that can transform that into deliciousness. And I can feel so grateful for all of that gratitude celebration. And simultaneously, without taking away from that gratitude, I can sit with like the pain and the horror and the genocide that is the story of America. And I can mm -hmm. like hold both of those things simultaneously and they can both be true and neither can take away from the other. And like, that's mm -hmm. how I am, can be a whole person. And so I'm so grateful for that in this context of this week. And I'm also grateful that I'm able to hold those perspectives as I navigate my legislative work too. Thank you, Emily. I am, I, I wanna say something to add to your point, but first I will say, I am very grateful for the people in my life right now. Just, you know, over the past almost two years, we've been, separated by the pandemic, we've been separated by all sorts of things. And just the number of people who reached out this week and they're like, what are your plans? Do you have a place to be? Um, you know, Valley Cares where my mom lives just opened up uh, allowing visitors again. So just being able to, um, I'm grateful for dogs too. Um, <laughs> being able to have coffee with my mom on Thursday morning is just a real treat and being able to see friends on Thursday night is going to be a real treat. Uh, so I, I'm just grateful for people and how big their hearts can be. And I wanna say thank you for, for what you just said too about uh, holding more than one thing at once because as someone who is of both um, white European descent and of course, uh, looks white and is mainly that's the culture I was raised in, in many ways. Um, I am also part of Beneke. And so I hold those two pieces in literally in my body and in my ancestry. And it is often something I sit with um, and, and wonder about in my own life and how am I living my life to both um, make the world a better place, but also honor what came before. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to say thank you for to you for sharing that and knowing that uh, I'm not the only one holding mm -hmm. uh, what could be polar opposites, mm -hmm. but do sit in the same space at the same time. So thank you. Thank you, Olga. So I think we should toast to all our listeners in this time of Thanksgiving, because we don't know how many there are and we don't know how you tune in, but we are glad you do. And we are grateful for you and to all the guests who have come on in this past year, despite the COVID. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you, Emily, for showing up every week. Cheers, Olga. Cheers. As always, we hope everyone has a good week. You can find the Montpelier Happy Hour on Fridays on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, as well as our Captivate page, our Facebook page, and Emily, where can folks find you? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and you will find links to all the socials, any upcoming events, and all my contact information. Have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs>